So hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to this knowledge exchange, exchange session. Um, we are delighted that you could join us. Um, my name is Sarah, and I work at the EAD Secretariat in Bonn, Germany. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with EADI, we are the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes, and we work in improving the visibility of development studies throughout Europe and promoting cooperation between um, our members across countries. Um, you can have a look at our website if you want to get more of a sense of our activities at EADI.org. And we also have another knowledge exchange session from last year up on our YouTube channel, if you're curious. Um, so just a few words. Uh, about the format of this workshop. As I mentioned before, this first session will be primarily presentation and discussion. So um, our speaker will talk for roughly half an hour, uh, an hour, half an hour, pardon me, and then we will have time for a discussion and Q&A. Um, so do save your questions for when we open that section and um, put your questions into the chat and we will communicate them to Anko, our speaker. And the second part, part of this workshop will start at 1 p.m. after a 30 minute break and will be more participatory, which is very exciting. So we hope everyone will be able to come back for that. Uh, but let's move on to our guest. The fabulous Anka Schwitter is with us today. Um, and I'm gonna forego a formal introduction because I know Anka will talk about her background a bit herself. Um, so I'm thrilled that you could be with us today, Anka. Um, let's hear from you. I turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Welcome, everybody. I just want to say I really appreciate um, that you're not out in the sunshine, but here in front of a Zoom listening to me. So, um, yeah, really nice to see you all. I'm really looking forward to um, spending the next hour and couple of hours with you talking about creative teaching. But first of all, I do want to uh, thank Sarah and Basile for inviting me to give this knowledge session and for um, organizing it so expertly. So thank you so much. I think I'm going to um, share my screen. I do have a few um, slides for this. Um, uh, settings. Okay, is that good? Can you see that? Brilliant. So, um, so my name is Anke Schwetai. I'm a professor of anthropology and global development at the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex, which is in the south of the UK, really close to Brighton. Um, and the uh, title of my talk is Teaching Critical Hope, Pedagogical Innovations in International Development. And I want to start off by telling you just a little bit more about um, myself and my pedagogical journey and kind of where I'm coming from in general with this idea of, of creative teaching. So I'm originally from Germany, you might hear that, but I've uh, lived abroad for um, a good many years and I've been kind of studying and teaching um, anthropology, which is my academic background, but now increasingly and inclusively in global development in, in North America, in Canada, and especially in the US. Then I spent five years in New Zealand, and now I have been at Sussex since uh, 2014. So I've been kind of um, exposed to a variety of kind of academic environments, but also different thinkings about um, international development or global development, as I call it, and kind of different geographies. And what's been consistent across all those academic environments has been a very critical focus of teaching international development that really um, teaches students about the, the contradictions, the limitations, um, the, the failures of international development and really gets them to think very critical about the sector and the industry. And students absolutely appreciate that teaching. They, they realize why it's important to, um, to, to develop that perspective, especially if they come in sometimes with a um, bit kind of naive ideas about, you know, kind of saving the world. Um, but I've also consistently, and not just me, also my colleagues with whom I've talked about that had a, a second kind of complementary reaction. And that is that students are saying, I know why it's important for me to, to, to learn about all of those things, um, but I can't help feeling a bit um, disillusioned and a bit deflated by this, this, this critical teaching because I care about the world and I want to make a difference. And I thought development was, was the field to do this in. And now you're telling me that nothing works. <laughs> Everything that's been done is, is wrong. And I don't quite know what to do with this knowledge. I don't know what that knowledge means for myself and for my kind of, you know, aspirations in the world. Um, and rather than um, accepting this 
you know, these, these conversations and these comments as like kind of, you know, tough luck. That's just part of studying development and becoming, you know, part of the, the discipline or being disciplined. I started thinking what I as an educator can do about this. Um, and kind of the question that I asked myself um, is how can I kind of teach critical thinking and critical analysis, but at the same time foster students' imagination? So how can I instill the, the, the questioning that is necessary, but also nurture um, a kind of hope in students or, or try and uh, keep students' hope alive in, in a critical way. And um, as I said, I've been thinking about this for quite a while, but I decided to do some um, kind of proper research on this. So I conducted a three-year research project at my home university in uh, at Sussex between 2016 and 2019. Um, in uh, um, the International De Development Department, which sits within the School of Global Studies, uh, where we have anthropology, geography, international relations, and ID. So it's a very interdisciplinary department. And over those three years, I conducted interviews with all of my colleagues and about 25 students after they had finished their studies. So kind of these, I call them student journey interviews. I did a systematic review of all our teaching materials. Um, I did in-class observations in a number of classes that my colleagues are teaching that the interviews had identified as being particularly um, transformational and, and inspiring. And then I also conducted what I call experiments in my own teaching. Um, specifically, I teach a third year specialist option on urban futures and a uh, master's level um, option on um, um, uh, activism for development and social justice. So that's the two spaces in which I kind of, in which I teach. In addition to the research at Sussex, I also did a research at a number of uh, Bolivian universities in La Paz because I wanted a Global South perspective um, when I talk about um, alternatives that was really important for me to also get an understanding what that means from a very different perspective. And basically what this all came to is uh, my kind of proposal for what I call a critical creative pedagogy for teaching international development or the social sciences more generally actually in order for students to better understand the global challenges we are facing and to imagine alternative responses to them. So I published a book with Bristol University Press in 2021. Um, you can see the cover here. I've also just published an open access article with Pedagogy, Culture and Society taught, uh, uh, called Teaching Critical Hope, which I think um, Sarah has kindly uh, shared. And there's also a project website, Creative Universities, which has a writing blog, which has interviews with fellow educators. We've had lots of resources. So that's another thing you might want to um, check out in relation to this work. Um, before I kind of talk specifically about what this pedagogy looks like, I want to just spend um, a bit of time talking more generally about some of the, uh, the educators and writers that have informed and inspired me. And I think the important thing here is I'm not an education person. So as I said, my background is in anthropology and I'm very much situated within international development now. So um, in terms of the people who I've read and, and used a lot is, is first of all, Bell Hooks and her call for um, teaching students to transgress boundaries, right? Personal, disciplinary, institutional boundaries. But I also do believe in what she says that classroom is the most radical space in the academy. I do believe that our classrooms are real possibilities to get students to think um, in different ways. Paulo Freire, very obviously, his writing on the pedagogies of hope and the importance of hope within teaching, but also his consistent reminder that we need courage, humility, uh, persistence, um, and just patience in order to transform teaching. Um, the other um, people who have been hugely influential are J.K. Gibson Graham, um, a um, kind of a, a economic and political geographers, and discovering their, I think it's a 2008 article on the academic subjects of possibilities, where they really make the case of that as academics, we are potential world makers. We have the performative power to with our work, both research and teaching to bring new worlds into being, to sow a seed, to help it grow and germinate. And that was very, very inspiring for me. They talk about the importance of, of weak theorizing to, lead, to let those 
to provide space for these alternatives to grow, which in my own work I've adopted in a form of, of generative theorizing. Uh, Sarah Amsler and Carrie Fraser are um, a couple of UK academics who have written a lot about teaching in relationship to the future, about kind of radical pedagogies um, and about kind of regimes of anticipation. And they have really helped me think through what does it mean to talk about uh, futures and then in complement to that, thinking about alternatives, I've um, drawn on Arturo Escobar's work quite a bit in terms of um, pluriversal alternatives. So when I talk about alternatives, I very explicitly mean heterodox or non-stream alternatives to what I call kind of the mainstream solutionism in the face of global challenges. And I'll have some examples of what that means in different fields at the end of my presentation. So that's been my pedagogical inspirations. And then uh, really quickly, I think it's also important to define what I actually mean by creativity when I talk about um, creative universities. And it's very much people who have written about academic creativity. So Ken Robinson's work and his definition of creativity as the ability to leap out of familiar habits into new, new idea spaces and making those connections between formerly disconnected um, areas and allowing students to kind of, um, you know, jump and draw these things together. Again, Alison James and Stephen Prockfield are two UK academics, and I really like their, their definition of um, creativity as moving away from the well-trotten to sniff out the subtle indicators of possibility to move sideways and move beyond. And again, this idea of kind of opening up spaces and, and allowing students to come at things from different sides and to be comfortable with that. Uh, Ron Barnett has written quite systematically about five different forms of uh, that the creative universities can take. And I've really taken this up in my most recent article and, and kind of engaged with his writing more. And I think it's also important for me to define what I don't mean by a creativity. And it's that kind of what Rob Pope has called the, the version of corporate managerialist creativity, which is a very instrumental economic understanding where creativity um, contributes to um, national competitiveness and economic growth. And he kind of showed in his, in his work how it's emerged in the kind of the, the 1950s in response to a particular global context. And universities, when they talk about creativity, that's often the one they mean when, when kind of, you know, senior leadership, it's about, you know, the creative industries and fostering that more corporate creativity. And that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I have a different idea. And then um, I also think that every student and every educator um, has creative potential. And it's a matter of helping students to, to, to find that potential and again to provide spaces where they can be nurtured. Um, because, um, you know, it's, and I think James and Brockfield talk about that creative teaching can become an imposition and become in, can become another form of disciplining. So, by, by, by I think talking about everyday creative potential that can be fostered and nurtured, I think it's really important to be aware of the possibility of that um, um, not becoming um, an, an imposition. And then last but not least, I think this, this image I actually have up here is a bit misleading because creativity is not kind of the left brain and the right brain ne neatly separated. It's actually a continuum. And, and Ken Robinson and others talk about that between critique and creativity, they go together. They, they, they often, you can't have creativity without being critical about the creative ideas you're developing and vice versa. You can't really do cre critical thinking without being creative. Um, but I did use this image because it's so, um, it's, it's so kind of widely recognizable, but I really do believe that they sit along a continuum and that we really talk about degrees of difference between, between both. So having kind of given that, that more theoretical preamble, here is what this critical creative pedagogy that I'm kind of proposing looks like. And it, it is a, consists of four different strands that are kind of interwoven in this, in this kind of integrated whole. The first one is whole person learning, then the use of creative design and arts methods, um, praxis, and all of that feeding into um, nurturing students' critical hope. And I've kind of, 
represented that in the form of, I call it kind of a guiding star or a flower of, of, of critical creative teaching. And as I said, these four strands are interwoven and they can really be as small or as large as you want them to be. I think of them as very much expandable. And when we do the, the workshop this afternoon, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what that actually means. So what I'm gonna do in, I think the remainder of my talk is um, go through those four strands and give you some, I, some examples from my own teaching in terms of giving you some really concrete ideas of what that um, could look like. So starting off with whole person learning, um, it's really the, um, the idea I think that we all know, but sometimes forget that when students come into the classroom, they don't just bring their intellect and their brains, but they also bring their bodies, their emotions, their senses, um, and their, their own experiences. And I think um, whole person learning takes account of all of that and importantly creates spaces in which students might be comfortable to, to, to bring more of those, uh, you know, their, their, their bodily and their emotions into the classroom. And here's where I situate the importance of experiential learning um, and really saying to students that their experiences outside the classroom or on campus are really valid sources of knowledge that they can bring into their, their teaching. As I said, it needs the creation of, of safe spaces, of a lot of kind of care and facilitation, but also quite clear structured, or clear structures around this form of teaching. A couple of examples from my colleagues is the use of body mapping to maybe help students with understandings of, um, of, of power and where power is, is connected to, to their bodies um, and, and serious games, which often can be really embodied and, and use students moving across physical spaces um, to, uh, um, to understand. And the case I'm writing about in the book is around um, climate uncertainty. In my own teaching um, is I, um, I said, I teach a class on urban futures and by the time students take it, they all live in Brighton. So I actually use Brighton and teaching in Brighton a lot to ground my teaching. And the students start off with keeping a diary of them, themselves as Brighton residents for the week. And then they come together to write a Brighton manifesto. And this is very much based on their reflexivity about how do I inhabit Brighton as an urban space? And what they do, I set up a Padlet, which allows students to post what I call an artifact about themselves. And this particular one is one which is also on my website. It's the one that the students created during COVID, during absolute lockdown. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, 2021. Um, and it, it was very much a space where I you know, said to students, think about how you move in the city, what are the places you visit, what are the places you like or not. But with COVID, I also invited them to reflect on what they had lost and what they were mourning at that particular time. And the, the Padlet is um, it became an incredible space for students to, to share um, uh, the things they were, they were really missing. And that really brought home for me the, the idea of, of inviting students to also think about those kinds of emotions. And uh, for me, that's a good example of a, a particular kind of, of whole person learning. And that kind of brings us to the second strand and which is the use of design and arts methods. The arts obviously being really good to open up um, um, the imagination, right? Novels and poetry and, and artwork. Um, but I do want to spend a little bit more on the, the design element because that might not be as widely um, known. And I think both kind of theoretically and practically design has a lot to offer. Um, critical creative teaching and the first one is this I, this kind of design idea of, of wicked problems right and defining global challenges as wicked problems that are complex that are interconnected that don't have easy solutions that have a lot of uh, moving parts and where, where different stakeholders often can't even agree on a definition of a question so really understanding uh, complexity and, and systems thinking related to that uh, both design and art help students develop their capacity to, to imagine, to experiment, and to empathize, which I think is really important. The ability to ask open-ended questions and to remain with open-ended questions and in a space of, of ambiguity rather than always wanting to know the solution or the answer and close things down. Again, design um, has particular ways of, of, of helping with that. And then in terms of practice, what I like about design is that it always uh, reminds us and allows us to bring the materiality of teaching to the forefront. And as you can see here, for me, that's very literal. 
I do scenario building with my students, right? What do you imagine Brighton 2050 to be like? And actually build that, use your hands, use different materials to, um, um, to make that visible, to kind of create, create a model of that. And again, it connects to whole person learning because when students play around with their hands, when they open up a can of Play-Doh and saying, oh my God, that reminds me of my childhood. And of course, childhood is, is often a time of more playful creativity. I think it adds another dimension to, to learning in the classroom. So as I said here, kind of my example again is students building um, scenarios of what they imagine Brighton 2050 to look like, and then what are the different steps they would need to take to work with others to get there. This again leads into the third trend, which is uh, the notion of praxis, which um, is informed by Freire's writing of practice that is informed by theory, by reflection and by dialogue with others. So again, this interlinking of theory and practice really important here. And I think that's, that's really important for our discipline of international development, where the idea of, of saviorism or white saviorism, or I actually think of it more as, as expert saviorism, can be quite dominant. Um, and in order to, um, to counter that, to move students away from some of those ideas, the, 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 the theoretical reflection on practice is really, really important. Um, it's really a form of, of applied learning or problem-focused learning um, or learning by doing together where I, in, in all of my teaching, I teach a lot of concepts and theories and abstract ideas, but I always, always have exercises where I ask students to apply that to, to real world things. And, and the example I have here is actually Sussex campus, where in a, um, a week on, on urban infrastructures, where we you know, talk about infrastructure as socio-technical assemblages and, and unequal access to it and how this is being kind of mediated by different forms of power. And then I say, I was split up into groups and do a walking seminar, walk across campus and search out water and food and transport and energy and map that and, and talk to people around it and, and become aware of how these infrastructures are being used by humans, but also how they intersect within the ecosystem. Our campus actually sits in a national park. So it's quite a unique campus. There's a lot of green space. Then students come back in the classroom, they do a, prepare a presentation and they also, they, they kind of share what they've learned, but I also ask them now think about how to make infrastructures more sustainable. What are some of ideas you have in terms of, um, you know, kind of, kind of pushing that particular element of infrastructures. And again, for me, that's a, a really concrete example of, of learning by doing or learning by doing together because group work is another element I use a lot in my teaching. And then last but not least, as I said, this feeds into this idea of, of, of critical hope. And I kind of started off by my uh, thinking about how can I, rather than taking students' hope away, how can I keep it alive, but not in a kind of a naive, in a kind of fantasy kind of hope, but in a, in a very critical, aware um, and informed stance. So I think that's, it's, it's a hope that is, that is reflexive that's reparative in terms of looking at the, at the past and some of those longer legacies of international development, but that is also active and is also forward looking. So it's kind of a very temporal, very active form of, of critical hope. I, teach, I talk a lot to my students about prefiguration, this idea of, um, you know, um, I guess you could say, you know, be the change you want to see, but very much the ability of, of them enacting in the here and now, some of the things that are bothering them. Um, and some of the things I talk about in, in, in the book are, you know, a kind of teach outs. We've had a lot of strikes for those of you in the UK. So uh, using teach outs in some of these spaces, um, uh, decolonizing obviously as a particular um, kind of movement in Sussex and other universities around critically thinking about how to do teaching differently, co-creation. And what that looks like in my own teaching is I do teach a class on activism, which makes this quite easy. And 50% of the class is again students working in group and developing an activism campaign on a topic um, uh, they are choosing and, and really thinking very systematically about the different elements of the campaign. 
Um, but it was also for me in, in, in the book very important to look at what do students do with their knowledge outside the classroom, right? What happens when they graduate? What happens in their, in their extracurricular activities? And at the time of my writing, um, it was the height of the um, uh, Friday for Future school strikes. So a lot of the interviews was around um, climate justice and climate justice activism. And I learned that in Brighton, like in many other cities around the world, we had you know 10,000 students coming out on one particular Friday. And it was actually a whole bunch of global studies students who organized these strikes mainly, um, which I thought was, was really impressive and a really good example of using um, uh, particular knowledges together with lots of other skills to organize these school strikes. And just really quickly, my most recent project is uh, focusing on student housing cooperatives in the UK as another very concrete examples of students very actively prefiguring alternatives to the, um, the, the, the student housing crisis in the UK and the very commercialized student housing market. Um, I said I would give you some more ideas of what exactly I mean by, by, by alternatives, and I'm kind of want to finish up with that. So as I said, the, my first chapter focuses on remaking academic subjectivities, because I think when we talk about any kind of changes in our way of teaching, in our way of um, interacting with students, we need to start with ourselves and the ground we stand on. So I talk about both our own um, subjectivities as teachers, but also thinking about our students' subjectivities. And that's where I developed this idea of generative theorizing. I talk about decolonizing and decentering ourselves. I do have a chapter on reclaiming economies. And some of the alternatives I introduced in this chapter is ideas around degrowth, ideas around diverse community and solidarity economies, which again are very much informed by the writing of um, J.K. Gibson Graham. Um, uh, I do have a chapter on repairing ecologies, where I kind of start off with a critique of, of, of sustainable development, showing out those the, the contradictions in, in that term, and then say deep ecology um, systems and complexity things are some of the alternative ideas that um, that students can be taught. But and this is where my research in Bolivia um, came in the uh, different epistemologies, so the 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 um, kind of um, idea of Bon Vivir, good living, which has come out from particular Andean understandings of nature and humans' uh, relationship with the ecosystem in quite a complicated way. There is a big literature on Bon Vivir, and it's not kind of, it, it's uh, the politics around it are again a really good way to teach students about how some of those alternatives are taken up and, and, and mainstreamed. Um, and how um, you know indigenous peoples are trying to 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 reclaim this, and then as in last but not least, my chapter on prefiguring alternatives um, includes many of the things I've talked about with the previous slides, but really where again working with experiential pedagogies and opening this up to bringing students experiences and work outside the classroom into class and kind of validating that as sources of knowledge that that. Um, I learn from every time students talk about what they are doing and also students learning from each other. So I think, um, yeah, 30 minutes. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. A, um, yeah, really looking forward to your questions. As I said, there is the book, um, there is, is the article, which I haven't put on here. There is uh, the website. And I actually just wanted to, again, coming back to Sarah and Basile, I really like when you pick the image of the dandelion. <laughs> because um, I've recently become involved in something called the Dandelion Project and learned a little bit more about the amazing power of dandelions to just kind of disseminate ideas. So I put that on my last slide. So thank you so much. And I think I'll um, stop sharing and looking forward to your questions. <laughs>